Welcome to the presentation for current semester. This is module nine for nursing 150. This presentation will discuss the infectious disorders of the lower respiratory tract. Those disorders include pneumonia and tuberculosis. The term pneumonia describes inflammation of certain parts of the lungs, such as the alveoli and the bronchioles. Pneumonia may be caused by either infectious or non-infectious agents. Examples of infectious agents are bacteria, fungi, and nonspecific viruses. Non-infectious agents may include irritating fumes, dust, or chemicals that are inhaled or foreign matter that is aspirated. Nosocomial pneumonia is a hospital-acquired infection that may be attributed to inadequate hand washing, poor sterile technique with suctioning, contaminated equipment, and exposure to others who have infectious respiratory conditions. People who are most likely to contract pneumonia are smokers, those with altered consciousness from alcohol seizures, anesthesia or drug overdose, those who are immunocompromised, chronically ill people who are malnourished or debilitated, and people on bed rest with prolonged immobility. Infectious pneumonias are categorized as community acquired or hospital acquired, which means um, you know either they are admitted with a pneumonia or they acquire it as they're here for many different reasons, um, as a, some of the reasons that I mentioned. Some other risk factors is just being an older adult, presence of other chronic comorbidities, and recent exposure to respiratory or influenza infections is um, some very common causes of pneumonia. An elderly patient that acquires a influenza can easily develop into a pneumonia. Um, the comorbidities that put a patient specifically at risk for pneumonias is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Sometimes patients with asthma, it can put them at higher risk for acquiring a pneumonia. One other thing to remember regarding pneumonia is an aspiration type pneumonia is when someone aspirates maybe a food or a fluid into their bronchial, um, not if they're having trouble swallowing. So they're with their difficulty, they are having trouble ma maintaining the muscles of their swallowing. So it could mean that some of their food is going down in their bronchioles, not into their esophagus. Um, and aspiration pneumonia is more likely to occur in elderly patients, and sometimes this is associated with a stroke or other disease processes that might prevent them from having adequate swallowing ability. The patient will often present with a complaint of a cough, a frequent cough, a frequent productive cough. They will also complain of fever, chills, sweats, some chest pain sometimes due to the frequent coughing, shortness of breath, sputum production, headache, and fatigue. Elderly patients may present with confusion, poor appetite, weakness, and sometimes their fever and cough is not as obvious in an older adult. Viral pneumonia is sometimes characterized by burning or searing chest pain in the sternal area. Um, and a barking cough, producing small amounts of sputum and headache. People with a bacterial pneumonia may um, experience an abrupt, almost um, acute onset, severe shaking chills, sharp um, pain with coughing, um, and then more of a purulent um, productive cough with bacterial infections. This isn't always really obvious whether it's bacterial or viral, but there are a few subtle things that can point out to us if it's bacterial or viral. There's some talk here regarding bronchial breath sounds heard over areas of density or consolidation. Um, this is when you hear bronchial breath sounds more on the bases in the outer parts of the lungs because remember you should only hear bronchial breath sounds around the upper part where the bronchioles are. Fremitus 
is often heard over air or felt uh, palpated. Remember when you put your hands on a patient and have them um, repeat 99, um, you can, the pharmacist can help you determine whether a patient has consolidation. Consolidation meaning that they have fluid or um, inflammation in their lung fields because really all that should be going through those lung fields is air. Um, percussion is dulled when you're, remember when you percuss, um, it's a dull sound rather than more of a hollow sound. That air would be a hollow sound when there's fluid inflammation and secretions in there, it's going to sound more dull. Chest expansion may be diminished or unequal and, and they, their work of breathing may be increased for the patient with pneumonia. Productive cough is usually a pretty um, distinct sign and symptom of pneumonia, especially if it's related to headache, chills, fever, and pain with coughing. Diagnosis of pneumonia is usually based on the findings of the history and physical exam. Make sure you review, you know how to assess a patient, um, looking at their oxygen level skin, work of breathing, vital signs, things like that. It's based on, and then talking to them about their history. Sputum culture, um, culture and sensitivity will help us determine if it is a bacteria and ex exactly what bacteria is causing it. A chest x-ray helps us to view the lungs and determine um, what, if there is an infectious process going on in the lung fields. A CBC can help us to determine whether someone has an elevated white blood cell count, which is indicative of infection. Blood cultures may also be performed to determine if an organism has invaded the blood. Remember, this can lead to sepsis if that occurs. Um, arterial blood gas, um, and that's getting a sample of arterial blood, not venous blood. We typically get venous blood for most um, blood tests, but this would be an arterial blood and that is help, helps us to look at the oxygenation of the blood. We can actually look at oxygen levels in the arterial blood sample and remember the arteries is what takes oxygen to the tissues so it gives us a good indicator of how much oxygenation is being taken to the tissues. If we get a sample of arterial blood and test it, we can also test it for carbon dioxide levels Carbon dioxide levels can tell us how well we are making a gas exchange and help um, identify a need for supplemental oxygen. Um, we'll look at the patient's um, renal function as well to determine if there is also any dehydration. We can look at the blood urea nitrogen level because um, oftentimes patients will become dehydrated with pneumonia. Again, going back to chest x-ray, chest x-ray may not show um, changes two to until two to three more days after manifestations are present, but you can usually see an increased density, which tells us that there is um, some inflammation and fluid um, related to the inflammatory process of pneumonia. The term atelectasis is often used for collapsed or airless condition of all or part of the lung. It is usually acute and commonly occurs at the same degree in patients undergoing surgeries, um, an airway obstruction, or just damage from um, an infection such as pneumonia. So atelectasis, just make sure you understand what that term means. It's usually referring to collapsed or airless condition of part of the lung, which can be seen on x-ray. Prevention is typically very um, essential to making sure that our patients do not get pneumonia. We talk about this a lot. We do this a lot in practice with our hospitalized patients. We do lots of different um, strategies to prevent a patient from getting a pneumonia. That's because the complications of pneumonia can be very um, detrimental on some patients. Um, patient education about vaccination is important. In the prevention of pneumonia, there is a, a pneumonia vaccine. Currently, the pneumonia vaccine is um, recommended for patients who 
um, have comorbidities that would be at risk for complications associated with pneumonia. Um, elderly patients um, are encouraged to get it along with um, getting their yearly flu vaccine. There's an, a great chart in your book that discusses um, preventing pneumonia. Um, a lot of that includes um, encouraging patients not to smoke or be around people who smoke. Any kind of irritant like that could damage the lungs and makes it make it more susceptible to infection. Um, maintaining hydration, eating a balanced diet, activity, enough rest, um, avoid indoor pollutants, um, and things like that are, are lots of different strategies that we can educate a patient in the prevention of pneumonia. Nursing care can be reviewed in your book as well. There's a good, um, actually kind of a concept map that you can find in your book, in, um, the chapter on care of the patients with infectious pulmonary diseases. Um, Interventions such as um, making sure that we apply oxygen therapy when it's needed and monitoring and maintaining oxygen therapy. Really, um, nursing care is based on making sure that our patient maintains a patent airway and that our patient um, receives enough oxygen to the tissue to maintain homeostasis. Incentospirometry is encouraged um, for the prevention and the treatment of uh, pneumonia. It is used to improve inspiratory muscle action and to prevent or reverse atelectasis. Remember, atelectasis means alveolar collapse. Taking a deep breath in with your incentive spirometer helps to reopen all of those alveoli. Instruct the patient to exhale fully and then put that mouthpiece in their mouth and take a long, slow, deep breath in. Um, make sure you understand how to teach a patient how to do an incentive spirometer. What goes along with that is coughing. Make sure they do coughing and deep breathing. The coughing um, helps to clear the airway and then the deep breathing helps to um, open the lungs. It also helps to exercise the muscles associated with breathing, which can um, be weaker when a patient is ill. Other medications may be given, such as antibiotics. We may be giving inhalers. We may be giving inhalers such as bronchodilators or steroid inhalers. We need to be able to effectively teach a patient how to use these um, medications and how to do them properly. Um, expectorants or decongestants may be given. We need to educate our patients on the, all those medications. Um, the key to teach, treating a bacterial infection is antibiotics, but we have to be able to make sure that our patients understand how to take all of these and take them um, um, with, make sure they have the best instructions how to take them effectively so that we treat that germ effectively. Preventing airway obstruction in patients with pneumonia includes making sure that they are active, that they can cough. Um, suctioning might be indicated in some patients to remove an airway obstruction if it's mucus. Promoting recovery from pneumonia means about the same thing, making sure they um, continue their care as they, if they are discharged, they may need to go to a pulmonary rehab. They need to continue to cough and deep breathe and need to be continued to um, make sure that they keep their airways clear and that they promote opening of the alveoli by doing coughing and deep breathing and activity. Some other things that can help in the recovery of pneumonia is to maintain adequate nutrition to offset extra calories burned during infection. High calorie, high protein diets can help um, a patient maintain their nutritional needs. A lot of times if you're short of breath, um, Eating large meals can make you even more short of breath because digesting a large meal requires oxygen. We also need to monitor fluid intake and output. Teach them how to um, control the spread of infection. 
And think about what this means for us. It means making sure they um, put their hand over their, or their elbow over their face when they cough, sneeze, things like that. Prevention of aspiration pneumonia would possibly mean an NG tube. Elevate the patient's head um, and administer feeding slowly. Uh, making sure that if they are nectar thick liquids that we maintain the ordered diet. Okay, moving on to another infectious disease process of the pulmonary system. Pulmonary tuberculosis is an acute or chronic infection characterized by pulmonary infiltrates and formation of granulomas with something called casation, fibrosis, and cavitations. Um, the American Lung Association estimates that active TB um, afflicts nearly five out of every 100,000 people. Prognosis is excellent and with the correct treatment. Mycobacterium tuberculosis is a major cause of TB. A patient um, will inhale TB, the mycobacterium um, infected droplets, and then that's when the battle begins. TB is spread by inhalation of the droplets, um, and so um, our job as nurses, and we'll talk about that in the next few slides, is really making sure that we put a patient in isolation who we suspect may have TB. Transmission of TB occurs as an infected person coughs or sneezes, spreading the infected droplets into the air. And someone with poor immunity inhales these droplets, and the bacilli are deposited in the lungs when we breathe it in. Then the immune system responds by sending leukocytes and inflammation to this area when the bacteria is introduced to the person's lungs. After a few days, the macrophages, which are a type of white blood cell, come um, and ingest the bacilli, and they carry the bacilli off to the lymph nodes. Um, the macrophages will ingest the bacilli and kind of form these tubercle formations, um, and it's kind of like a little lesions or these case um, encapsulated areas um, that's kind of like scar tissue within the lungs. So sometimes a patient can be exposed to TB and the body is able to encapsulate it in the lungs and the patient never has an active TB. They would have an exposure to it and what would happen is they would, this TB skin test that we have on a yearly basis would um, then be positive, um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more specific. If the TB skin tests are basically screenings for exposure, they do not mean that a person has active TB. And that's um, kind of why I wanted to go to this slide. This is an important statement here. Far more people are infected with the bacillus than actually develop TB. Some people may have an exposure and never develop an active TB if they have a healthy immune system. They would be a carrier of it. Um, and like I said, they would probably test positive with a TB skin test. It doesn't mean they have TB. It just means that they have an exposure to it. The TB skin test um, is a screening tool to determine if people have an exposure and if they're at risk for um, spreading the disease because it is highly communicable, so we want to screen people to determine if they are active or not. This slide is meant to be a visual of every, pretty much everything that I just explained. Um, it shows this transmission here that occurs through um, droplets in the air. The um, cavities open into the spread with coughing and goes and it gets into someone's lung and um, usually the patient can just encapsulate that bacteria through the use of their macrophages and it never becomes active. However, um, some people can become, have active TB and usually it's people who have a poor immune suppressant. HIV patients are at high risk for getting an active TB 
or if somebody has maybe other pulmonary issues already, patients with um, pulmonary disease associated with smoking are at high risk for an active TB. Patients with TB um, will uh, present with fatigue, lethargy, nausea, poor appetite, weight loss, and a low-grade fever. Um, the signs and symptoms that typically set this disease process apart from other um, pulmonary processes such as pneumonia is these right here. The low-grade fever, night sweats, cough, and the blood um, streaked productive cough. The other one is um, this anorexia and weight loss. Typically that occurs with a TB. So if somebody presents with night sweats, bloody um, productive cough, anorexia and weight loss, we will suspect that they have a TB. Um, other questions we are going to ask is any exposure. If they've had any known exposure to TB in the past, if they've been exposed to sick people, what kind of um, place do they live in? If they live in an area where there's a lot of ill people, that might be another thing that would, might, might make us suspect that someone has TB. Um, and then other comorbidities. If they're an HIV patient and they present with these signs and symptoms, we are going to be very suspicious. And the first thing that we do is go ahead and put them into that droplet isolation and um, I don't know if any of you have seen anybody. It's a negative pressure isolation. Um, and if you've seen anybody on the floors in, in a TB precautions, um, this is, means that they have a special room that has a negative pressure. So basically it takes all the air that's in that room and it takes it throughout a special filter out of the building so that that air is not inhaled by the rest of the patients in the hospital. Um, and then the other thing is, is um, at the Christ Hospital, they use the PAPR. And I know at other facilities, they are a special mask that they use in order to, um, for healthcare workers to not be exposed to the droplets that the patients with active TB or breathing into the air. Again, this is just a visual of um, signs and symptoms of pulmonary tuberculosis. And like I said, night sweats is a really um, indicative thing that makes us a little bit suspicious. Um, coughing up blood, appetite loss, and fatigue are other pretty significant symptoms of TB that kind of helps it stand out from other infectious processes of the lungs. So like I said, if we have a patient that comes in and they have these signs and symptoms, they're coughing up blood, maybe they're an HIV patient with um, anorexia, weight loss, night sweats, uh, we will suspect a TB. We will put them into isolation for TB, a special TB droplet isolation. And then um, we will do some tests to determine whether that is true or not. There's a new test that's listed in your book. It's called the Nucleic Acid ampli Amplification Test for TB. It's a kind of like a rapid test now that they've developed because it used to take us like a day or so to determine whether the patient, so we'd put them in isolation, but we wouldn't know for sure for a couple of days. Now we have this more rapid test that results are available in two hours. Um, it's recommended by the CDC that we use this test um, because it is so quickly. That way we can treat patients appropriately in a more um, rapid manner. Um, there is a blood test. Quantiferin TB Gold is a blood test that is testing for the presence of the mycobacterium tuberculosis. Usually results are um, ready for us in 24 hours with that. That is... Um, if, if somebody does not have access to um, the NAA test. These are all kind of um, predictor diagnostic tests for us um, to kind of continue to keep somebody in isolation. A sputum culture is the confirmation. And as we know, any kind of a culture takes a couple of days, um, actually a week to four weeks to... Um, 
determine whether it's positive or negative. So that's why we've developed these two more rapid. If these are positive, we're going to keep them in isolation. Sputum culture is the confirmation of the mycobacterium tuberculosis, but it takes too long. So um, we'll go ahead and if we can do these two and they're positive, we'll keep them in isolation and then we'll get the result of the sputum culture in a couple of weeks to help us um, confirm this. Um, in getting the sputum culture, make sure you understand how to obtain a, a, a sputum culture in a sterile container, making sure that the patient, you're getting a productive cough from the lungs, that a patient is not just spitting in a cup. They're actually coughing up um, sputum from the lungs because that's what we want. We want um, a, a specimen that comes from the lungs. Chest x-ray can show us um, the encapsulated TB. If a patient has any of these encapsulations in their lungs, it can just kind of um, confirm that and let us know if there's any other infectious processes going on in the lungs. TB skin tests, we know that um, we get kind of as a screening tool. And again, like I said earlier, it essentially really just tells us of an exposure. It does not mean that you have TB if you have a reaction to the TB skin test. Usually what happens is if somebody has a positive TB skin test, and there is a um, picture of that in your book, a picture of a positive TB, and it's usually just some redness and a little bit of edema. It just means you're reacting. Um, to the tuberculin that they have um, put in, in the intradermal injection. And again, it just tells us an exposure. If somebody is positive, we're going to do further testing to determine whether it's an active TB or not. And here's that picture I was talking about. So this is that positive. So it's, it's red, it's elevated. Um, sometimes people get bruised from these and they think that they're having... A positive but it's got to be red um, and people are specifically trained to um, read these and it's usually a reaction of five millimeters or greater is considered positive so sometimes people get like a tiny little red mark but that's not considered positive it's usually um, greater than five milliliters millimeters once someone is identified as positive for TB they are, um, have kind of just bought themselves something called combination drug therapy for, uh, for tuberculosis. It's the most effective um, method of treating TB and preventing transmission. Oftentimes, this combination drug therapy for tuberculosis is um, a long-term therapy. It can last um, 6 to 12 months and it's expensive combination therapy um, that has some side effects. So um, it's a patient education with these is very essential. These meds are listed um, in your book and first line treatment for tuberculosis. Izonazid um, is one of the most common medications an important teaching topic with a patient on azonazid, which is um, also known as INH. That's what this one right here. Um, they need to take a supplemental B complex vitamin with this med. This med can cause a peripheral neuropathy, which means like just pain and numbness in their extremities. Um, and with large doses, so B um, vitamin B complex vitamins can help prevent that. One of the major things with tuberculosis medications, the combination medications, is that most of them, the patient should not drink alcohol while um, taking the drugs. Izonazid is one of them. Um, so oftentimes, patients who have tuberculosis um, might also um, have, we often can find it in homeless patients who are alcoholics as well, so this can be difficult treatment. Um, rifampin is the next med here. That one you cannot also drink alcohol with it. 
Um, a lot of them have toxic effects on the liver, and that is um, one of the major reasons why they cannot drink alcohol with it. Strict adherence to the prescribed drug regimen is crucial for suppressing the disease. Um, major role is teaching the patient about drug therapy and stressing the importance of taking it as ordered, um, exactly as prescribed for as long as it's prescribed. It's hard to follow these patients sometimes, like I said, if it's a homeless patient or something like that. Um, that's why TB has been on the rise a little bit more recently. Um, there's been homeless patients who are drug abusers who are passing TB around um, and not being treated properly because they don't have the money. And, of course, they're not going to stop drinking. So um, that a, that's can be a problem with some of this treatment. So, again, the first-line drugs used for tuberculosis can damage the liver. The patients are highly encouraged not to drink alcoholic beverages for the duration of the TB therapy. And, you know, not just for this, but it's also going to help them get better quicker because um, the decreased alcohol intake is going to make for better nutrition and better health status overall. The following slides are um, some case studies and questions regarding pneumonia and tuberculosis. Again, as always, I encourage you to try to answer the questions presented, um, and you can check your answers in the PowerPoint comment section. And this concludes the presentation um, for part three of module eight.